I'm so, she is like on my shoulder. Here she is. No, she's not sleeping, but this is her resting. But anyways, yeah, she's my little baby. My sweetie. She is getting bigger. Yes. But anyway, uh, we're going to do the show me prayer. And I'll explain this to um, since we have lots of new faces and I love seeing our familiar faces and our new faces and some old faces that we haven't seen here in a while. So I hope to get to visit with you all. Um, I'm so glad that you're here. But we do the show me prayer. We do this every Sunday, partly because it is a really good prayer. Jim and I started praying this in our home and really, we based it on um, several um, things that we had done, Freedom in Christ uh, ministries. If you're taking some of those classes, then uh, you're familiar, you'll be familiar with some of this. And so, um, but we wanted to share it with you guys. We still pray this at home very often. And so, again, we... we um, we hope that you can remember it. If you want to take a picture of it, you're welcome to do so. And so, but how we pray this is we pray it out loud and I will lead it and then you guys will repeat it out loud, okay? Lord Jesus, show me what you want me to know. Jesus, show me what you want me to do. And Jesus, show me what you want me to stop doing. I will be a doer of your word, not just a hearer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, how is everybody? What's the day? Christmas? Thanksgiving? Thanks. Um, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you. Uh, uh, hanging with me. With my voice being gone. You know, we love you, Jim. We love you. We love you. God bless you.
see, I believe, into the future of the church. I don't think they, I think they thought Jesus was going to come back soon because all of us think that because every century it looks like it could be the end of the world. But we didn't notice that there was a plan to it. Neither did they. See, as smart as the apostles were, and especially as smart as Paul was, I call him the genius of the New Testament. He didn't know God's time frame. And Jesus said, I don't either. It's just when he tells me to go, I go. When he tells me to stay, I stay. Because Jesus is the ultimate servant. And I got to thinking about this. So since I've been on hospice, and don't let that word scare you, I actually looked forward to it for the people I was going to meet. Because I knew that God had nurses that needed to know Jesus. I knew God. There's another commentary. <laughs> That's okay. I'll whisper louder. So... So, I also was looking forward to the chaplain I would meet. And my chaplain, her name is Catherine. And she's Catholic. And she is precious to me and Michelle. And in her Catholicness, they pray liturgical prayers. They pray prayers that were written 900 years ago every Sunday. They read prayers that were written 500 years ago every Sunday. I think we evangelicals miss out to some on this not reading prayers. And then as I started my daily Bible reading plan this year, I started also doing my daily devotional. And in that daily devotional, and the prayers that are after, there are two written prayers every week, every day. And so I take pictures of them when they speak to me. I've prayed some of them over you. I've prayed some of them in here over you. And I have a real appreciation now in my life for prayers that were written a thousand years ago, 1,500 years ago. And then when God showed me this the other night, I went, oh my gosh. Now, I've told many of you, many of you ask me, how do I get understanding in the Bible? It's real simple. I pray in accordance to what God will answer yes to. And that's not manipulation. It's being in line with them. So this is the way I pray before I read. Father, sometimes I don't understand what I read. Would you give me understanding? You think he's going to go, no, no. Of course he's going to answer yes to that. And Father, when I run across something that's hard to understand, when you, will you reveal your truth in it. You think he's going to, no, no, I ain't going to do that. He's going to answer yes. And then I end with, and show me something I never saw before. So the other night at 2 a.m., he showed me something I never saw before. These prayers. So today's sermon, sort of, is 10 prayers from the letters written to the different groups that Paul, Peter, and Jude. The reason I said Jude, because Jude is interesting. Jude is a half-brother of Jesus. Jude has a perspective that's totally different than the others. How would you like to have grown up with an older brother that you never knew he had a different daddy.
because he was probably five or six years older than the other boys. And his dad died young. And the oldest brother, according to Jewish tradition, took over the role of the dad. So this guy is your older brother. And he's acting like your dad. And one day, he turns to James and he says, because James is one of his other brothers, and he says, by the way, you are the breadwinner of the family now. I put all of my firstborn attributes given from God to you. And James goes, what are you going to do? You're obviously not engaged. And he actually goes, yeah, I actually am. Who are you engaged to? I'm going to birth the church, my bride. And James went, I've got an absolute lunatic for a brother. <laughs> and then James told Jude that. And Jude thought the same thing. All of these kids thought Jesus was a nut job. You can't be born of a woman and be the Messiah. How does that work? So when we end with Jude, I want you to see what he says about who Jesus is. Because for Jude and James, two books out of the Bible, to humble themselves and call themselves a slave unto Jesus or a bondservant unto Jesus, that says more than it does to the other apostles. They're humbling themselves to say I was completely wrong about my brother. He is the Messiah because my mama did not have him through Joseph. She had him through the Holy Spirit. Now I have a funny story in that. Have you ever thought when Luke decided to interview Mary before he wrote his gospel because Luke wasn't there. And he's a Greek. So all he can do is take notes and then write what the people tell him. And I think he calls Mary and he says, I want to hear your story. And she says, well, I need to tell you my story. But it just dawned on me before this letter is published. I need to tell my kids <laughs> have you ever thought that might have been what it was like and so she said let's take a break she goes home gets all the grown kids together goes by the way I haven't been completely honest with you an angel appeared to me and your father and he told us that I was going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit and that we are to name his name Jesus which means God saves and he is the Messiah in fact when you saw him die the other day he died for you too for your sins now you think everybody's jawing on the ground they're going what I've called him names I've told people he's crazy. She says, I know. And it pains me that you did that. But I forgive you. Now would you honor him as the Messiah? I mean, when you stop <laughs> and actually think about what that looked like, is that not somewhat the way we come at the cross? We come at the cross. They're going, I don't know if this is real or not. But if we're in addiction, we're sick and tired of where we're at. We are tired of being mentally incompetent. I've got to try something new. And so we in addiction come at it sometimes quicker and more vulnerable. But even my wife at eight years old said, you know what? Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm a sinner, and I'm in need of a Savior. Dad, can we go talk to the preacher across the street? It's halftime at the Dallas football game. And he says, 
place go? She goes over there and the preacher said, Hon, what is it you don't understand? She goes, I don't understand it all. I just want you to make sure I pray the prayer right. And he goes, you don't need me. Just pray. And she prays and she receives Jesus at eight. She understood at eight what I didn't understand until I was 30 years old. Some people are given understanding at different levels. Either way, we're all in need of Jude's brother to be our Savior, Jude's half-brother. So when we get to that prayer, I'm going to make note of it big time, okay? All right, Wayne is going to read, but I'm going to ask Jason and Big Chris to comment on a couple of these prayers because I want you to hear a perspective that is one minute after they read it. Okay? And then I'll give you comments along the way. All right, go ahead. Here we go. And I'm starting at where it starts. It starts in Romans. Okay? Okay. Now all glory to God who is able to make you strong. Just as my good news says, this message about Jesus Christ has revealed his plan for you Gentiles, a plan kept secret from the beginning of time. But now as the prophets foretold, and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere, so that they too might believe and obey him. All glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. What I love about Paul's letter to the Romans out of context. We are an offshoot of the Roman Empire. Some people go, oh, we're America. No, they had an eagle as their mascot. We got an eagle as our mascot. They had uh, Washington monuments all over Rome. The city is set up like a Roman city. Washington, D.C., so we've got Roman roots. So I call the book of Romans Americans because it sounds like it was written about 200 years ago. See, how I make the Bible personal. There are times that I read stuff and it really hits me. And so I will nickname certain books so that it speaks to me so that I'm all ears when I read it. Okay, go back to verse 26. But now, as the prophets foretold, and as the eternal God commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere, so that they too might believe and obey him. Who is he talking to? 1940 years ago, this was written for you. Paul, oh, yes. Galatians 1, verses 3 to 5. Okay. May God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned, in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Sometimes the simplest prayers, we just remind ourselves when we're praying that God had a plan that he sent Jesus at the right time. He sent Jesus at the right time. I think I got into this a little bit Wednesday night. 
but there is 2,000 years from the time that Adam sinned to Abraham. There's 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus. And there's 2,000 years from Jesus to about seven years from now. Does that sound like a plan to you? Amen. Now, don't be trying to set no date. <laughs> because God already told you you ain't going to get it. And the reason is, is because he knows the millisecond. And you don't. But can we look forward to his return? Yes. Absolutely. And I've said this before. Everything's being set up right now for the man of sin to show up. And the minute he shows up, three and a half years to the second coming. See what I mean? It's like we're close. When all of this Israel has whooped everybody's tail all the way around them. Right now, did you see when Assad let go of his regime? First thing Israel did was go in and destroy their navy. He destroyed their whole navy. And the Russians backed out of there and headed back to Moscow. They're afraid of Israel. That's because God, in all of their battles that they won, sent out this fear before them. Does that sound like a plan to you? And in that scripture, he was praying that prayer for all of us to be saved into the future. And then ask for God to give us peace. Okay, next one. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 23 to 24. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters, and may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. May God's grace be eternally on each one of us until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Do you realize from the moment of your salvation you can have peace in your life? I don't care what your situation is. Amen. Do you know that a third of the people maybe up to half of the Gentiles that were being saved were actually slaves in the Roman Empire. How did they have peace? God told them to serve their masters as if he were serving them. I gave you some history the other night. Do you know by the second century after Jesus the Roman Empire started seeking out Christians that are slaves to be their servant because they were the most obedient and they took care of their stuff as if it was their own. You mean they sought them out because they were living so Christ-like. It's crazy. But he prayed that prayer over us too. Let's go to the next one. Next one, I'm sorry. One Thessalonians. Okay. Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. May God our Father and our Lord Jesus bring us to you very soon. And may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your heart strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people. Amen. All right. Put that one up there again. Jason, I want you to tell me what that says to you. So we're going to read that again. Want me to read it again? or You go ahead and read it again and then tell us what you think. May God our Father and the Wait. Lord Jesus... Hmm? Is that the beginning of it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Stop or go. Red light, green light. Go. One or the other. Go. Simon says. He's worried because if he gives me the green light, it might be here for another 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ bring <laughs> us to you very soon. And may the Lord make you... Make love for one another and, lo and for all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your, your heart strong, blameless, and holy as, a, 
holy as you stand before God our Father. When our Lord Jesus comes again with all his holy people, amen. Okay. And Randy, leave that last one up. So go ahead. Uh, Tell me what uh, you think. My, my mind's on overload now when you started with James and Jude. and um, yeah, I know. Uh, where do I, I even want you to start? Focus. I want you to focus yes. on 13. Yes, yes. This is Paul's signature, though. Paul does not say, hey, uh, I'm a great preacher. Come to me. Look no. at me. And all this. May God build you up. May Amen. God bless you. May, may you be with his holy family. Right. Paul is, every letter is encouragement. Mm. Even if he gives instruction and discipline, That's he it. will give you something to build you back up. That's it. And that is the charge that a lot of pastors miss. Yes. Not in this church, though. Not in this church. Because we're not here for us. We're here for God. Yes. We do what we do because God gave us the ability to do it. And yes. it's just, like I said, I, it's yeah. hard, to, hard to cut down on this. But, That's it. but when we're down, when we're low, we can feel like James and Jude. Because yes. here this guy was a great yes. preacher, their brother. And, we were, and I have an unfair advantage because we talked about it this, this morning. I so I feel like I rehearsed this because yeah. we're in James at the 945 class. But yes. then all of a sudden, Jesus gets resurrected. And they go, what? Oh, yeah. hey. Hey, let, let me tell you about my half brother. Oh, I mean, yeah. my Lord Jesus. I mean, exactly. we gotta talk about this car. Exactly. No, no. Let me tell you about the Lord. Yes. Let me tell you about what He's gonna do for you. Yeah. What He's gonna, what He did for us, and to go through what they went through and not give up and keep pushing through and keep Amen. driving through. That that was the gift that Jesus is still giving to us through people, Amen. and that's how we minister to other people. That's that was, it. That's what gives us the drive. That's it to get down here in the morning and teach a class or do two Sunday services right. with half a voice. It's because God loves us so much, he wants us to love on other people. And that is a gift that Paul is giving to people. Amen. Hey, let me love on you. Yeah. And then I want you to get what Jesus loved on me so you can Amen. go love on people as well. Amen. Excellent. Now, all of a sudden, you know, I see humor and everything, even in loss. So I went and he preaches a sermon with half his voice behind his back. <laughs> anyway, sorry. That was, that was my Superman stuff. Anyway, that was very good. One of the key words I clue in on is blameless. May he as a result make your heart strong. Blameless. Now why does he say that to us? Because the enemy constantly blames for every mistake you make, even if he tempted you to get you there. He's the ultimate traitor. He lures you in to a bad situation, causes you to sin, or at least pushes you into it. And it turns around and runs to God with an accusation the minute you fall. No. When I received Jesus into my heart, Jesus now stands in front of me. And when the judge appears, all rise, all be seated, gavel down, the defense attorney steps right in front of the guilty and says, Your Honor, he's with me. By the way, we're coming to the house for supper tonight. When you, when you see that, that makes you blameless. Your salvation makes you clean. You're dressed in white. I'm a saint, not a sinner. I'm a knucklehead. But that doesn't mean I have to stay there. Most of us, when we are tripped, by, tripped up by sin, are tripped up by, by it because we wallow in it. Oh, look at what I did. Why am I still doing this? Stop the self-loathing. Stand up, dust yourself off. Father, I'm with you. I confess my sin. And then Jesus goes, get back in the game. Right? Okay. Next one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. 
Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ there comes again. again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Now, God will make this happen because he is faithful. It's about his faithfulness. It's his plan. He's the one in charge. He calls you to himself. You are now his. You work out your salvation by learning to follow what his grace then gazes you as you learn to follow you. Then he sanctifies you, begins to set you apart for whatever work he has. And then he says, let's get him. Or in my case, like a lion, he goes, get him. By the way, did you notice I cut my sleeves off real quick? No, I brought my wardrobe change because you guys made it hot in here. I did. Anyway, isn't that a beautiful way to pray? Okay, let's do the next one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting. Paul, I do this in all my letters to prove they are from me. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So he prayed peace over us. He has prayed peace over us like five times. That's because Paul was writing half of these letters from prison. And all of these letters are an encouragement. How do you write an encouraging letter when you've been in prison for three years? You find the comfort within it. And then you praise God. You thank God anyway. And it makes you rise above the situation. Do you know, I, it's fascinating, but I think the Roman centurion then looked up at Jesus and said, this truly was the Son of God. I believe that one got saved. Then Peter goes and sees Cornelius, who's a Roman centurion, and he got saved. These Romans are falling to the feet of Jesus. These military men are falling to the feet of Jesus constantly. Now Paul's chained to one. He lives in the house. He's chained to the table. But the centurion is standing out front watching over him. And here's the crazy part. They discovered something the other day. And I believe it's in the West Bank. It's where a prison used to be. And they were cleaning off the slab and they found a fresco. 75 feet long, 50 feet wide. Right in the middle of it are two fish, which were the symbol of the first century church. This was made in the second century by a Roman centurion. And you know what it says? Jesus is God. Oh my gosh, the ranks of the Roman Empire were infiltrated with Christians. I wonder if that had anything to do with Paul. How could he elevate himself? Because he learned to be at peace in every situation. Next one. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 to 16. For just at the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only almighty God, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. He, can, he alone can never die, and he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him, nor ever will. All honor and power to him forever. Amen. Now this is interesting. That one starts out talking about Jesus, and then it flips over to God the Father and talks about his holiness, and no one can ever see him. See, it's because he doesn't have a body. There was this thing I heard by Lisa a few years ago. God is God with no skin. 
Jesus is God with skin. The Holy Spirit is God in your skin. You want to understand the Trinity? That's it. Why does the Trinity matter? Because it's three parts of one individual. I mean, I'm a father, I'm a son, and I'm a grandpa. I can be three things and be one person. So can he. But he's not limited by that, the way we are. Yeah, amen. Okay, let's go to the next one. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly, wait, who, for all who eagerly look forward to this, his appearing. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 to 21. Now may the, may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. All right, Chris. Chris, what speaks out to you in that? Mm. Go back to that first, verse 20, Randy. So here's the first of it, so you get a second. Now may the God of peace who brought up, who brought up from the dead of our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. And that is one thing I want to tell you right there that my mama knew. Amen. My mama knew it. She did not miss the point. She loved Jesus with all her heart. Yeah. But the only way she could have done that is by what that scripture just said. Jesus gave her that ability. Yes. Jesus will give you the ability. Yes. Yes. 
if you will let him. Amen. He loves you. You may not be where you want to be today, but thank God you're not where you used to be. Amen. 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 Thank y'all. Amen. Go back one more time to that scripture. <laughs> Did you notice? I had uh, somebody ask me the other day, why would Jesus be born in a stinking manger? Who better to get the attention of sheep? Who better to get the attention of shepherds? He was calling shepherds to himself. Remember, he's in the lineage of David. What is David known for before he's known for anything else? He's a shepherd. What did he tell Saul? I'll take care of that Philistine. A lion attacked my sheep one day, and I killed him with a club. And a bear attacked him one day, and I tore his jars apart. I'll do the same to that uncircumcised Philistine. Amen. Shepherds understand how to protect. Why did Jesus come as a shepherd? He understands your every need. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you, Chris, thank you for doing that. And the other reason I brought that up is because I've read this scripture now about 12 times. And twice this morning, and that just stood out to me this time. See how each time you read the Bible, different things can stick out. All right, Randy. Hey, let's go ahead and skip to Jude. Jude chapter 1, verses 24 to 25. Okay, listen to this and read it at the same time. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away, and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time, and in the present, and beyond all time. Amen. Did you see, did you see all glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time? and in the present, and beyond all time. The third time I read that through, I finally saw it. Look at that. And before all time, and in the present, and beyond all time. I am, I was, and I will be. Amen. It's Yahweh's name. It's God Almighty's name said in that last sentence. Is that incredible? Now, go back, uh, Alan, to the verse before that. Now, all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away. He's able to keep you saved. He's able to keep you from falling away. How does he do that? we got to stay connected to him. And if we disconnect, <laughs> we find the time to repent and we reconnect. That's what I did for six years. I lived as an alcoholic and a drug addict after salvation because I let my circumstances overrun me and I was too prideful to just turn to God. They were the most six, most miserable years of my life. And the day that I went to this revival, who the two preachers thought I was just a drunk in need of salvation, and the two men that invited me thought I was just a drunk that was in need of salvation, discovered I was already a Christian that's been living in the pig pen. And I repented, and everything changed. I know this scripture because I live that scripture. And he will keep you from falling away. He might let me go into the far country for six years. He kept wooing me back. Wooing me back. And will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. I don't care what the enemy says to you. If you are a follower of 
Jesus. God always see, already sees you as faultless and blameless. Thank God. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, man. How? How can I disrespect him by living like a fool? How can I disrespect him by doing the same old sin over and over? It's time to repent. And then when we repent, we tear the wall down that we built up. We let him fill us back up with his spirit. And we become everything he designed us to be. Even if you think you've screwed it up so bad he can't fix it. I thought I'd never have a family. Not only do I have a family, I have a church family. into this time of worship. So I might have to start over because I didn't. So sorry. Uh, got mixed up. You had to turn it off on the right. Let's try this again. Born to raise us from the grave. 